We've been uh, going through a series of messages uh, on Easter, and you may think, well, why are we still talking about Easter? But as I've shared before, Easter isn't just a day, it's actually a season. And uh, part of that uh, season uh, runs into the Ascension, uh, which is uh, 40 days after uh, Christ's resurrection, and then uh, the celebration then of Pentecost, which, uh, which is 50 days after the resurrection, uh, and that ushers us then into a new season. And today, I'd like us to really reflect on spiritual growth and uh, vitality and fruitfulness. And... I think as most of us have come to realize as we have, uh, as, as we have uh, been on a journey of discipleship following Christ, that there are lots of ups and downs uh, in uh, one's spiritual life. Uh, even for those of us who are in leadership, us pastors, missionaries, uh, I, I wish we could all say that, you know, we just have perfect devotional lives, that, that we never have a dry time spiritually, but I think... Uh, myself, uh, but I think most of my colleagues in ministry will say that, yes, there are ups and downs in ministry, but hopefully over time uh, there, can be, um, there can be growth uh, and, a, um, and, and just a drawing, clo drawing closer to the Lord uh, in our lives and in our um, ministry fruitfulness. What's interesting in terms of just reflecting on, on, on spiritual growth and health is that, is that it's sometimes hard for us, I think, to really understand how God's working in our lives. And sometimes what we may feel is a real low point spiritually may be actually a time where God really uses that time in order to help us to grow of, of, of Christian leaders. And it seems like even in those down times, they, as they look back, they see that God was really at work and really helped them to grow closer to God. There's actually an expression uh, that are used by some called dark night of the soul. And a dark night of the soul is, is, is maybe a time in one's life. And even for a leader uh, that I wouldn't necessarily say it's clinical depression, but it's just maybe feeling that God is absent or that God really isn't working in their lives or is as real in their lives as that as that they, they would wish them to be. But yet upon looking back on that period of time, a lot of times they'll say, well, that was actually a time, though I felt God was absent from me, actually he was working in my life to an, in, to an even greater degree than I would have anticipated and really helped me to move on uh, to, um, to continue to serve him in greater ways. And today we're going to be reflecting on the words of John in John 15, uh, in which he really is encouraging uh, his church at the time, uh, and, and I think even our church, uh, even now, here into the future uh, to continue to uh, draw closer to our uh, Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and really trust him for our spiritual growth and really trust him uh, for our fruitfulness. Um, I think there's always, uh, especially because of our, our sinful lives and our propensity to sin, there's always a tendency to drift. Uh, but John uh, continuously refers to the words of Jesus calling us to abide in Christ. And so I will have Dr. Tim uh, now read for us uh, John 15, uh, verse 15. And um, maybe you can come to the mic here. John 15, 1 to 8. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He, call, <clears throat> he cuts off every branch in me that does not bear, that bears no fruit, <clears throat> while every branch that, that bears fruit he prunes to see it will be even more fruitful. You are already <clears throat> clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I and remain and I will remain in you. No branch can bear uh, fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. 
Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he's like a branch that is thrown away and, and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Thank God for his word. As we uh, reflect on these words of John uh, relating the, the, the words and the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, we see an illustration. And this illustration is of vine and branches and fruit. And it's actually this particular kind of illustration is called a mashal. And a mashal is a Semitic form that includes an image, image in its application to real life. And so there's an image and then, and then a relation of truth to that. So it's kind of like a, 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 he, a Hebraic sermon illustration. It would have been very, very well known to the people of Palestine. Uh, they were, even though there, there were cities like Jerusalem, it was by and large more of an agrarian society and everyone would have pretty much had a pretty good idea of, of vines and branches and things like that. I think in our more urbanized society here in America, uh, there's probably less of a uh, knowledge of such things of, of all things horticultural. Uh, but nonetheless, I think most of us uh, know enough about plants that we can still derive truth and, and, and helpfully find meaning in this illustration given by Jesus. And we see here that uh, Jesus says that I am, I am the vine and my father is the gardener. So basically he's breaking down the illustration and basically uh, assigning uh, the different, like, like who is who is what part of the illustration. So uh, the father is the gardener and Jesus is the true vine and you and I and those who are seeking to follow our Lord are the branches. And we're going to break that down a little bit here. And so the first thing that we see is that the father is the gardener. So he's the one that's taking care of the field. He's the one that's taking care of all of the, the, the plants. And in verse 2, it says that the father, the gardener, will cut off every branch in me that bears no fruit. And so for those uh, dead branches or those that maybe aren't even dead but just aren't fruit-bearing, um, the gardener, our father, begins a pruning process and will basically cut off those branches that, that aren't bearing fruit. And then it's, he, it goes on, John goes on to say, Jesus goes on to say, the branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes so that it'll even be more fruitful. So for those branches that are bearing fruit, there's still pruning that needs to be done uh, in order to help make them more fruitful in the future. So uh, if we indeed uh, begin to bear some fruit, uh, our Father wants us to bear even more fruit, and so there's a pruning process, which basically means that God is going to be continually working in our life to help to mold and shape uh, our character uh, and help us to grow in righteousness and holiness that we may indeed serve him and that we may indeed uh, bear fruit for his glory. And so um, bearing fruit is often a painful process. Uh, maybe not too painful. Sometimes it is more painful than the others, but, the, but God does want to, uh, to, to work in our heart and life, and he really wants to um, just help us to, to, to grow in him. In our uh, adult Sunday school class today that we uh, resumed after so many months of uh, COVID lockdown, uh, we were talking a little bit about gold and how gold uh, is refined and it's heated and, and then the dross is basically burned off. And that is what God wants to do in our lives. Sometimes that's a painful process, but he wants us to live in purity that we may serve him for his glory. Now, the, the, the second um, image we see here is that of the vine, and that, of course, is Jesus. And it's interesting because it says that Jesus is the true vine. 
Uh, he doesn't just say he's the vine, and so in saying he's a true vine, I think points to the exclusivity of Christ, and it also points to the fact that that I think Jesus is saying now that truth comes from me. Uh, in in uh, Jesus's time and context, uh, truth would have been found through uh, through Israel and through the the, the worship of uh, God and through the adherence to the to the Old Testament and to the and to the law and the prophets. But I think Jesus is saying here is that that time has passed and now truth is found in me. I am the true vine. And I think that's difficult to hear, especially uh, to modern ears, because uh, we live in a in an era and time of what's called pluralism, where basically all truth claims have some validity. So you can be, you know, someone can be Hindu and someone could be Buddhist and someone can be Muslim and someone could be animist or whatever it is, but there's all valid validity to that. But Jesus is clearly saying that he is the true vine, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And then in verse 3, he says, you are already clean because of the, of the word I, sp I have spoken to you. Now, when I was reflecting on this, it actually was a little confusing because we have this whole discussion of of pruning and of branches uh, and vines. And then all of a sudden Jesus says, you are already clean. And I, I'm like, what does cleanliness have to do with growing plants? And then I looked at the Greek and I saw that the word for clean is actually the same word for pruning. And I think in English, we don't like to use the same word twice in the same sentence. We tend to use synonyms for other words. So to say, well, Jesus is, you know, like there's pruning and then Jesus is pruning. Uh, they chose the word clean, but actually this word clean means pruning. And so Jesus has already uh, begun a pruning process in our life through the words that he has spoken to us and to his disciples. And then Jesus goes on and says, no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. And so what Jesus is saying that indeed uh, sustenance and nourishment and fruitfulness come through him. It's not that the branch can somehow uh, generate the fruit on their own, but uh, the, the, the branch must, must be uh, integrated into the vine and much, must receive uh, its sustenance uh, at the life and life-giving uh, nourishment from that particular vine. And so Jesus is the true vine, and it is through him as that vine that we can indeed uh, grow in our spiritual walk with him, but also bear fruit for him. And then lastly, uh, he talks about you and me, his disciples, and we are the branches. And in verse 5, it says, If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. And so as, as we remain in him, uh, as he remains in us, uh, we indeed will bear much fruit. And that is the secret of our fruitfulness. So the word remain here actually equals, or it's the same as the word abide. If you look at other Bible translations, the English Standard Version, New American Standard Version, some of those uh, use the word abide throughout the, the passage. Uh, the NIV has chosen to use the word remain, but indeed they are uh, the same word, uh, just maybe a little bit different. Um, um, I think the NIV is just trying to get a, at a little bit more uh, modern uh, of, a, uh, of an understanding because I don't think abide is a word that is used very much anymore. It is interesting that in the Gospel of John, he is very concerned about this whole notion of abiding in Christ, of remaining in Christ. He actually uh, uses this word 40 times throughout the Gospel. And um, in this just these eight verses that we're reading today, he mentions abide or remain nine times. And so this is uh, definitely a, a concern uh, for John as he wrote this gospel. And, um, and he draws upon the, the teachings of Jesus, uh, who also uh, was a concern of Jesus, uh, that we abide in him, that we remain in him. 
The word abide or remain indicates loyalty or a deep attachment to Jesus, but also to God. And so we're, we're called to draw closer to him. Uh, we're called to, uh, to have our loyalty and our allegiance uh, to our Lord Jesus Christ and to, uh, to really forge a deep attachment uh, with him in our life and our walk with him. And then in verse 5, Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. And I don't think you can get much clearer than this. We are called uh, to live our lives uh, abiding in Christ, remaining in Christ, because apart from him, there's no spiritual growth. Uh, there's no um, um, drawing closer to him, uh, experiencing his goodness and grace, and there's no fruitfulness in our life. Indeed, apart from me, you can do nothing. And so as we read these words, we do uh, find encouragement that indeed we, uh, we can bear fruit for the Lord. But Jesus also gives a warning in this verse. And it's interesting, I was uh, listening to a, a sermon recently, and, and the pastor was saying that, you know, the Apostle Paul really didn't talk that much about hell. He didn't really talk much about um, judgment. It doesn't mean that he didn't allude to it, uh, but it's actually Jesus who is much more explicit in his teachings about the judgment and hell. And we kind of see, we do see that in our passage uh, today. Now, before we, we, um, we look at that, I do want to have a little quiz. Now, if for those of you who are into plants, this may not happen to you, but this is a typical plant that I would take care of. Uh, there, there's, there's usually some dead parts to it. And so the question is, should you cut off dying leaves from your houseplant? Should you cut off dying leaves from your houseplant? When I was looking at this question, I was like, you know, I hope I haven't been getting this wrong for all these years. So uh, I kind of thought I knew what to do, but and I was correct. Yes, you are. Uh, you're to remove brown and dying leaves from your houseplants as soon as possible, but only if they're more than 50% damaged. Um, I know that I've cut, I'll usually cut them off. And sometimes if there's some brown, I'll cut around the leaves. I'm not sure if that's good for the plant, but that's another question. Um, and the reason why you cut off these dead, plants is it frees up it frees up nutrients for new growth because if it's you know a half dead leaf um, that leaf is still drawing nourishment so if you cut it off then it gives more nutrients uh, to the other parts of the plant it also prevents the spread of disease or pests because maybe maybe that part of the leaf is diseased and it improves the health and the appearance of the plant overall. And so, uh, indeed, uh, it's helpful to be pruning our plants. And, and in this mashal, this, this illustration, indeed, we see uh, God the Father as the gardener taking time to, to prune uh, off the, the leaves. But Jesus actually has a, a very stern words, a warning uh, in regards to this. He says, if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. I mean, we, we, we talk, you know, much about God's love and the, the love of Jesus. And, and it seems, you know, people uh, even who don't know God uh, seem to have a respect for Jesus and his words. Uh, but Jesus said some very harsh words when it came to the afterlife. And here it says that for those uh, who do not remain in me, they're picked up in, and thrown into the fire and burned. And so this uh, refers, I believe, uh, to a couple of things. And uh, it seems like there's definitely an aspect of final judgment and that those who uh, do not remain in Christ uh, are in danger of being tossed into the fire and burned, which would refer to hell. Uh, but it seems like there's also maybe a, a, a more earthly or temporal aspect that those who kind of re, who do remove themselves from the body, um, I I think excommunicated would be kind of too harsh of a word, uh, but it would be basically once one is removed from the vine, uh, re removed from the nourishment of God, in a sense they're, they're kind of living now outside of the community of God and they're no longer really receiving the benefits uh, of uh, having a relationship with Christ.
they're kind of on their own and and we know the wages of sin is death and death doesn't just mean uh death in the afterlife but it's also experiencing the consequences of our sin and our actions even in the here and now so i think there's there's both a temporal um uh, aspect to this but also an eternal aspect to what jesus is saying that the uh, that the gardener will uh, basically take the branches and throw them into the fire for them to be burned so jesus does issue uh, a stern warning but as jesus moves on he actually um gives a wonderful promise or maybe it's more than one i think promises might actually uh be better and jesus says if you remain in me and my words remain in you ask whatever you wish and it shall be done for you this is to my father's glory that you bear much fruit showing yourselves to be my disciples and so there's a number of things going on here so as as we are abiding in christ and he is abiding in us as we are in a uh, relationship with him uh, we can ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. And so there's, um, this is referring to praying according to God's will, that the more that we draw closer to Jesus, the more that we uh, seek him and understand his, his, his will in the world and his, uh, his will and his way in our lives, uh, we will begin to, to pray according to that will. And as we pray according uh, to his will, uh, he will indeed answer and it will be done according uh, to uh, our wishes, which indeed are the wishes of our Lord. And it is a promise also of bearing much fruit. And this has, you know, we've, we've kind of looked at this in, in, in uh, throughout this passage, but it's something that Jesus continues to reiterate that his desire is that we bear much fruit and it's a promise that we will bear much fruit. And there's a couple of things that come with this bearing of fruit. One is that it shows, it says it's showing yourselves to be my disciples. And so I think bearing fruit actually is an assurance to us uh, that indeed we are children of God because we, as we see God's working in our lives, we, we and, and, and fruit is beginning to be born uh, both uh, through our character in bearing uh, the fruit of the spirit in our life, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, but also uh, bearing fruit in terms of uh, maybe our, our ministry in the world um, in a sense that, that assures us that God is working in our life. But it also, um, I think, shows uh, itself to others uh, that indeed God is working in our lives. Uh, like I said, spiritual growth uh, is a tricky thing because sometimes we don't think we're growing, but actually we're growing. And I would say that when I was a young Christian, I, I didn't think I was hardly growing at all, but but my friends and others can see the, uh, the, the testimony of God in our lives more than we can. And so this is what I think Jesus is getting at here, that, that indeed as we are bearing, a fr when, when we're fruitful for our Lord, uh, indeed um, that gives us assurance, but it also is a testimony to the world. And then ultimately this is to the Father's glory. And so God is glorified through the fruit that we bear. I like this summary um, of, of kind of the dynamics that are happening that are happening in our bearing fruitfulness to our Lord from Richard Foster. Richard Foster is uh, well known for a book called um, The Spiritual Disciplines um, uh, or Spirit of the Disciplines. And um, and Foster writes the reality of a heart abiding in Christ. And so ultimately, this, uh, what he's saying is there's an inward reality of a heart abiding in Christ. That is, that is uh, Foster's description of what's going on when we are drawing near to God, when we're abiding in Christ, when we're remaining in Christ, uh, that there's an inward reality of the heart that's being touched, uh, that, that is being touched by our Lord, uh, and that is what means by abiding. And then through this inward change, this inward uh, uh, reality in our life that's being transformed, uh, then we begin to bear fruit in our actions and also uh, in the fruitfulness that our, our Lord will have in our lives as we seek to serve him. How then 
can we live this out uh, as we seek to follow the Lord uh, today and uh, throughout the week and even forward in our lives? Well, I think there's several things, and basically it's a, reiter a reiteration. We're called to abide in Christ. We're called to remain in Him. Uh, we're called to a, uh, a loyalty uh, to our Lord, an allegiance to our Lord, a growing allegiance, uh, but also a drawing closer to Him uh, as we seek a deeper walk, a deeper relationship with our Lord. And we do that by abiding in His Word. And again, in, in this passage, it says that Jesus purifies us through his word. We're cleansed through his word, and we're called to draw closer to him through his word as we live out his truth. And so this is a calling to us to even uh, maybe dive deeper into uh, God's word uh, in, in, our, in our Bible reading. And we do have a Bible reading plan uh, in, our, in our church, in our congregation, uh, in order to help encourage us to, to stay accountable and to uh, be uh, just helping to to encourage one another to be part uh, of, to, to take part in, in, in reading and learning from God's word, but we're also called uh, to study. But most importantly, we're called to live out that truth in our life that, that God's, we're called for God's word to abide in our hearts and our lives. So that means we're really seeking to live out his truth in our lives as we seek him. And finally, we're called to abide together. Um, as I was reflecting on this verse, um, there was one commentator that was talking about vines, and I, again, I'm not an expert on vines, um, but they said that, that the, the branches coming out of a vine uh, usually are very tangled. They're kind of intertangled, and it's kind of hard to find uh, like where one one you know branch of a vine ends and where one begins and and they said this is actually a good illustration of our life together that we're that we're intertwined uh, we're not just uh, not we're obviously not seeking to live our live our life on our own power because we do that by being um by, by drawing our, our nourishment and our sustenance from Jesus, our vine, but also as we are entwined together as branches, I think this is a call for us to encourage one another and to seek the Lord together uh, in order that we may indeed bear fruit, not only as individuals, but also bear fruit as a congregation as we draw closer to him and as we seek to uh, as we seek for his kingdom, kingdom to come in our lives and our ministry as a church community. And so, ultimately, uh, Jesus uh, concludes here uh, that the desire ultimately is to glorify God. And Jesus says, by this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. And so, ultimately, our spiritual growth and our fruitfulness for God um, is a benefit to us, it's a promise to us, but ultimately it's about glorifying our Lord and Savior. Uh, we, we really want to glorify our Father in all that we do in our lives, uh, in our ministries, and uh, in our church community. And so let's be encouraged to, uh, again, refocus our lives uh, on, our, on our God and seek a deeper walk uh, through the relationship with our Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you, uh, Lord, for uh, these words penned by your Apostle John. Uh, we know that uh, in that in the first century, uh, it was a very trying circumstances. There was persecution uh, that was being levied against uh, the church uh, by uh, by Rome. Uh, there was persecution uh, that was being uh, undergone by the church. Uh, through the through through Judaism and through uh, and through the synagogues and through the leaders there, and it really put our uh, brothers and sisters in a difficult uh, situation. Uh, but Father, we we thank you that uh, that that Paul that John drew on uh, the words of Jesus to really encourage the community uh, to abide in Christ, to remain in Christ. And Lord, we, we know that that calling remains today, Lord, for us to draw closer to you. And so help us indeed to live out our lives for you as a community, as we seek to abide in Christ, as we seek to abide in your word, as we seek to abide together to encourage one another in you. 
we pray in Jesus' name, amen.